Welcome to episode 251 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. I am your host, Kim Newlove. I am a pharmacist by training, but I'm not in clinical practice anymore. I'm a voice actor and a podcast host. My specialties are medical narration and podcasting. You can find the show notes for this episode on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. Click on the podcast tab and find episode 251. My guest today is Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD. She was featured in episodes 185 and 229 of this podcast. She returns to the podcast today to talk about Veterans Day and the PBS documentary Invisible Core. Why talk about Veterans Day and this documentary? Because tomorrow is November 11th, 2023, which is Veterans Day. For my listeners outside of the United States, Veterans Day is a United States holiday, so a federal holiday, celebrated annually to honor America's veterans for their patriotism, love of country, and willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. On Veterans Day, we thank veterans for their service. Thank you, veterans. Thank you. Why talk about this documentary, though? It's because it features veterans of the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. It fits into my Veterans Day theme. Now, before I roll my interview, let me tell you a little more about my guest, Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD. Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer retired in September of 2018 from a four-year term as the Assistant Surgeon General and 10th Chief Pharmacist Officer of the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. As chief pharmacist officer and first female in this role, by the way, Dr. Schweitzer was responsible for providing leadership and coordination of more than 1,300 public health service pharmacy officers in 13 agencies with the Office of the Surgeon General and the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Schweitzer continues to support the pharmacy profession and national efforts to increase access to public health initiatives, especially in rural and underserved communities. Rear Admiral Schweitzer earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of California San Francisco School of Pharmacy and completed an ambulatory care slash administrative residency at the University of California Irvine Medical Center. She is recognized for her leadership contributions, including the Surgeon General Exemplary Service Medal in 2018, the ASHP Distinguished Leadership Award in 2019, was an APHA Next 10 Women in Pharmacy honoree in 2022, a Cal State University Fullerton Vision and Visionaries Award recipient, and received a Distinguished Alumni Award in 2023. That concludes the introduction for Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD. Now for a short introduction to the documentary Invisible Corps from PBS.org. This one-hour PBS documentary covers the history and role of the Public Health Service, the Public Health Service Commissioned Corps, and how public health has evolved throughout our history. It explores how public health has become politicized and how important it is to change that in order to positively affect the nation's health for years to come. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD. Hi, Pam. Welcome back to the Pharmacist Voice podcast. How are you? Fine. It's so good to see you again, Kim. (laughs) Oh, it's awesome to be here with you. We are celebrating veterans today. This is the Veterans Day episode 2023. I'm so glad to have you with me today. I know. I'm glad to be here too. And I will, on Veterans Day, I'll be in Albany, New York, by the way. All right. What will you be doing in Albany, New York? Well, it's the pharmacy school there is going to be celebrating veterans too. And so I'll be there for their ceremony um, and giving a presentation from representing the vet. They bring the veterans in, the local veterans in. And of course, I'll, I'll be highlighting or acknowledging all the, the veterans that are, that, that are, that are pharmacy veterans. And they usually recognize the people that are active duty too in the area. Sounds great. Safe travels to you. Thanks. And you mentioned veteran pharmacists. At this time, I would love to invite you to explain how can pharmacists be veterans? 
there's got to be more than one way. There, there is one more than one way. So there's eight uniform services, um, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Space Force, U.S. Public Health Service, NOAA, the pharmacist or public health service pharmacist. But most people don't realize that if you go to the Coast Guard for the health care, that's being provided by U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps pharmacists. So the, so anybody retiring and putting a career in is going to be a veteran. So they are public health service pharmacists, but they also worked for the Coast Guard. The same thing, far, we have pharmacists in the U.S. Public Health Service that are also integrated in some of the other services. They may work in Defense Health Agency. Um, they, so they're kind of scattered in different agencies. There also there's Navy pharmacists, Air Force pharmacists. So there's there's pharmacists in in other services too that are providing service to their active duty or enlisted members. So what ends up happening is when they retire, then they're they're pharmacists veterans. We, you have a veteran card, and um, there's eligibility for veterans too. So there there are quite a few veteran pharmacists that are out there, and uh, many of us, just like me too. You know, you spend a whole year, all these years of service. It's really hard not to be in service afterwards. So you can usually spot the veterans. They're always giving back to the community. They're volunteering for things. They're very active. And it's a very a good camaraderie. Um, a lot of us, I spent, we're in Indian, Indian, Health, or Indian Health Service. We're friends to this day. I'll be friends to the end because you meet them and you work together and you end up uh, end up getting to know everybody really well. So it's all the different services. So veteran for Veterans Day, for Veterans Day, it's really going to be recognizing and honoring not only the veterans, but also those that are active duty, those that are serving their country, because they're doing things. And it's not like anybody goes around and says, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. It's they're, They tend to be a very selfless group, very service oriented. We do our duty. We serve our country. No questions asked. It's 24-7. And it's not something, it's, it's, it's something that we do because it's inside us, it's in our core values that, of serving our country. Thank you for the important work you do. I know you're retired, but everybody, veterans out there listening to this, thank you for the important work that you do. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. When I was preparing for this episode, I looked up Veterans Day. My dad's a veteran. He served in the Vietnam War, and he was in the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah, as he oh, taught yeah. me to say. <laughs> yeah, my dad. My dad was in the Army. He was uh, in the Korean okay. War. He was. He, you know, he was. He served two years. He didn't actually get deployed anywhere, but he was in the. He was in that time period. My great. My grandfather was in World War One. You know, I have good documentation of that. So I think it's great. I. I actually think if people ha are healthy and they are able to, I think going into the service is great. I have a nephew that's a Navy SEAL. I have another one in the Navy. So it sort of kind of falls in. People are very service oriented. My brother was in the Navy. Thank you for sharing your experience with your family. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how deep to go with mine, but my dad was in the service. His dad was in World War II. Oh. My Yeah. And then my mom's dad was in World War II as well. I don't know beyond that what service, because I, I guess I never met those relatives. But yeah, it was very interesting to grow up with that pattern of service, you know. And I was the only one among my siblings. There were three of us. I was the middle child. And I felt the call to serve. I heard the call to serve. But my son likes to joke that they hung up on me because I have asthma and they wouldn't take me. Oh. <laughs> but Navy would have been my first choice for sure. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know what? You're doing, you're serving in a different way. It's in your blood. You can't help it. True, true, true. <laughs> yeah. When you hear that call to serve, it's not a call everyone hears and you just try mm -hmm. to follow through. And like, right. like my son said, if they hang up on you, well, you move on. But you're doing it in a different way because you're highlighting the services and you're, you're highlighting, you're, you're, you're doing a good job highlighting. You've been a really good job at done that. In fact, I think you had met, we had talked earlier, you mentioned this is the fifth podcast that you've done, at least on the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps of, of different officers. And I think that's great. And you're really doing a good job of trying to make us more visible. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's right. Visibility. You know, that's going to be a theme today, the word (laughs) visibility, because one of the things that we're going to talk about whenever you're ready is the PBS documentary that was released in May of 2023 that goes by the name of Invisible Core. And Invisible Core is the public health service. At this time, I want to invite you, if you're ready, would you like to talk about this PBS documentary? Yeah, I would. I would love to. So I'll tell you how this started, and I have some numbers here so people see the see the problem. I didn't realize the problem when I when I first started until I started looking into this. So we have with us in the army, like I'll just tell you how many troops there are. Four hundred and eighty-two thousand, you know, plus troops in the in the navy. Three hundred and thirty-six thousand, almost three hundred and thirty-seven thousand in the air force. There's 300 and, um, let me see the air force. There's 329,000. So, you know, all in the hundreds of thousands here. And then you go and th- you go through each of the different ones. Space force is a small one. Oh, space force 16,000. That's what they have. And then we come to the U S public health service. We have 5,500 officers. So we're very, very small. So a lot of people have never even heard of us. We, as those of us that are in uniform, as we, as we go around, we're in uniform. People go, oh, you're in the Navy. It looks like we have a Navy uniform. Or you ask if you've ever heard of it. Even the mil- people in the military have never heard of this. So a lot of us have had our whole career this they've never heard of us. People think we're a pilot. Um, I remember coming onto a plane in uniform from, a, from giving a presentation, rushing to get on the plane, barely made my plane. I walked on. Everybody cheered. They thought I was the captain. So... We've all oh had gosh. we've all had these experiences, and then I, of course I'm very apologetic because I'm not the captain. So anyway, we've all had these experiences. So fast forward to me being retired, and I get a call one day from Vice Admiral uh, Jerome Adams. I think it was after I had been retired. He said, "Hey Pam, there's a co- class of of public health uh, people from the public health." Um, School of Public Health over in Utah, and they wanted to ask about the Commission Corps. Would you mind taking the call? And and they have questions about the Commission Corps. And I said, oh, sure, I'd be happy to. So I get on with the students, and they're working on a project, and they decided to pick the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. This is really how this all started. So after I talked to them, I realized there is nothing out there for me to share with them. They're not going to, they're trying to do a report on this, but it's like we're very like hidden away. Like you go and you see on TV during Super Bowl, all the, you know, the army, you see all the advertisements out there. You see a lot of promotion for, of the, of the different other services, but you never really see anything about the public health service, U S public health service commission Corps. So what happens when I was talking to him, there's just some things on the website and they were really trying to hard, hard to articulate what it was we did. So I spent some time with them Then afterwards, I'm like realizing we need to have, there needs to be something out there that would make it easy for people to understand what we do for the country. You know, long story short, then I made some phone calls. I called Rear Admiral Lushniak. He was retired too. And I said, do you have this problem? You're you're the dean at a public health school. Do you find that people don't? shouldn't it be built into the curriculum that you like every public health school should teach everybody at least what the U S public health service commission Corps does. Yeah. I found the same thing too. Found the same thing too. So anyway, it just so happened. I, at the same time, this is all during co- middle of COVID I had been helping and I met this producer and he was a director of a film and we, I was helping him get the word out. It was called the misinformation virus. And so chatting with the producer, the director. And I already knew because I had got to know him really well, what he was going to ask. His first, his question would be, because everybody hits him up. Hey, we should do a film about this. You should do a film about this. He always wants to know what's the audience. What's the purpose? You know, what, what's the, what's the message, main message, because you can do a lot of footage, but it, it, he only wants to do things that are going to be impactful and make a difference. And, you know, change people's minds, affect their hearts. He needed it to be most. So I already knew this about him. So we, you know, what happened was, as I, I gave him a book about the, Hey, just read this, not telling him what we were up to yet. Just read this and let me know what you think. And I gave him a book about the public health service commission Corps. And then I started talking with some of my colleagues 
just about what do you think the purpose, if there was a film about us, what, what should be the message? Because it's really hard to get in a one-hour documentary what we want the message. And so we spoke a lot, and it really had to be from the perspective of the outside. It couldn't be us talking about it. It couldn't be from our perspective. It had to be a different view. We needed that different view. So we needed the view from the outside. So anyway, we talked a lot about this. So this takes about six months just thinking about this. And then we, we piqued the interest of the, the director. His name is Chris Schuler. It piqued his interest. So I said, I'll tell you what, before, this is all his research. Why don't I start introducing you to different people and let's start asking, just chatting with them and hearing. And what I would do is it was different topics. Like let's talk to the team that was at 9-11. Let's talk to the folks that were doing Ebola. Let's talk to the folks that are in the Indian Health Service. Let's talk to the... So there is just a wide variety of breadth. And I, as I was doing this, people would give other ideas and I would just introduce them to him. And he was just collecting background material, trying to learn and figure. And you do this for about six months and all of a sudden it starts coming together what the film is going to be about. We sort of it's sort of like, a, here's is what it can be doing. You know, we want to tell a little bit of the history. We want to talk about the politics of public health. We want to talk about some of the silent work that they're doing. And we need to explain to the general public what public health is. So public health is about having safe streets. It's about healthy food. It's about having clean air and having clean water. And it's these other things that's not just direct patient care. And it's this infrastructure we have in our country that everybody, that we're all sharing together. And it's not just some people get it, some people don't. So so part of this was explaining some of that too. And then talking about some of the public health um, challenges that we've had over the years. Talking about some of the diseases, the prevention. You know, malaria was gone. Now it's coming back because of the, because it's, you know, we're starting to hear rumors that, or not rumors. It's starting to come back. But, you know, for a while while we had all these diseases that were out there that really public health quietly got them done. So he collected all this. He met with lots and lots of people. And then it sort of started coming together who he was going to film. And then the filming was done actually in a couple of weeks. He had a, he has to get a film. It was actually done in a really short time because once he gets it all done, he's kind of outlined. It's like a puzzle. I It was really fun going through it with him, going through it. And he interviewed several he interviewed several of the Surgeon Generals, both both the former and at different Surgeon Generals that were acting, very good speakers. Um, we had a, a good mix of try to get as many of the categories in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. So we, I know this is about pharmacists, but one of the things that are really fortunate for us is that we work with all different disciplines. Uh, we work, you know, with scientists and engineers, and we work with all the direct patient care, you know, dietitians and um, nurses, physicians. We work with so many different just veterinarians. We work with so many of them. And we also wanted to introduce the public to some of this other work that people aren't aware of. Like one of them, the veterinarians. Like, how is a veterinarian doing public health? So it's in the film, <laughs> you know, how what they do. And uh, it, I'll just kind of cut to the chase. A lot of the diseases you know, are in animals that cross over to humans. You know, for instance, COVID is one of them. It, 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 the examples of that. So anyway, the film then came together, it got filmed, and then the editing came, and then we hot, we premiered it in May this last year in front of the officers. I will tell you, everybody was on pins and needles. Be those of us, I, I had not seen the film. It was, I had not seen the film, but I knew lots of what it was about. I had not seen the final thing. It was such a, that, that's the requirements. It has to be, um, if I was, we we ha it has to be kind of kept it it's a, the um, director has full artistic um, control of it so but I knew where the controversial areas were you know we have to talk about the politics of public health there's some things in our past we had to talk about that and there were some of the opinions of some of the people that are formerly retired not everybody agrees with but they're all true but they're you know it's we needed it to get get out there for the general public to see that. So I will tell you, it was just wonderful to see the overwhelmingly positive response from our Commission Corps after they saw the film. And so now, since then, I've been really helping to get these screenings out. We've been uh, we've been um, in these film festivals all around the country. 
we are now in, and what we've been trying to do, this is actually kind of cool, is we show the film or pieces of the film, have a discussion about it, certain topics, depending on who the audience is. And then we have real live officers in uniform in attendance. So they see they really do exist. And there are officers scattered all over the country. And we try to capture some of the public health topics that people realize that, like if we go to a school, there's a public health school, we make sure that, you know, they get to know that there's an engineer, scientist, or an environmental health officer. And then they can talk, they can just share what they're doing. And we realize this network of this infrastructure that we have throughout our country is really, really pretty impressive. Um, the, the difference between what we do, and they do have officers that do some of the same thing in the military, when I say in the military, in the armed services, the Army, Navy, but we're actually in charge of our country, like supporting our whole country and our citizens and the world. We we are very involved in world activities too, which is a little bit of different different than the um, our armed services that are focused on taking care of their enlisted and um, uh, military members. So, so that's what I've been doing. That's where that's what I'm doing right now, probably for the next year. I love that you're promoting the film. I think everybody in the United States should see that because not everybody realizes that we basically have an army of healthcare professionals. I know it's not just pharmacists in the public health service, and there's not just doctors, nurses, et cetera, but there is an army of people who are taking the mission of the public health service to heart. And they are, like you said, impacting the entire country. I mm -hmm. think the public health service, though there are only, what, 5,500 people in it, yeah. they have the broadest impact. Right. And we worked together side by side ever, everywhere. And people just aren't aren't really aware of that, that, that we're out there. And our the officers... They have the same challenges. I, As I've been going around, I've had a chance now to visit with officers re recently. So I get a little bit of time and ask them how they're doing. It's tough on their families. The the When they talk about service, it's not just the job or what they're doing at work. It's also when you hear of the Hawaii, of fires in Hawaii, when you hear about the flooding that's happening up in the Northeast, when you hear about the fires, you know every single time there's any disaster, there's U.S. Public Health Service officers that are there. It's just you don't hear about it. You hear about FEMA or you hear about um, you hear about the National Guard, but we're we're actually there too. It's just we're so little, we don't have the same PR group to do that. And we're pro probably providing direction for any of the public health service topics. So we've had a lot of people that are poised. So I visit with them and my heart goes out because I realize the challenges. So you get deployed, you're going tomorrow. You're on call, you know you might go, but you have children, you have all these other things. You're, it puts basically makes the parent, a, you go from a family maybe to a single parent, but you, who's going to take care of the kids and do all these things? So it's a whole family event because a lot of people have to have their parents come and be there with the kid. You know, they fly in their parents, they have to be there. And it's not something that, you know, that the government pays for. They're, you have to make arrangements for all this. It's a sacrifice. It really is a sacrifice for them to go and, and do these deployments for who knows how long. Sometimes they say you need to go and then they extend you. So anyway, m my heart goes out to all of them and just the challenges when they do get. So every time there's an emergency, when you see there's some kind of natural disaster or some kind of any kind of disaster in our country, you know, and a lot of times in other countries too, because we send people there to provide direction, guidance. You know, we have these great, really smart people that are doing these things. And pharmacists is the, are the largest category. I don't know if I ever told you that. I did not know that. Right. So there's 11 categories and the pharmacy is the largest. And I'll tell you why they are, is because besides knowing the drugs, we're really good at a lot of other topics. Logistics, you can think, you can imagine that, you know, doing logistics and just organizing, coordinating, uh, leadership, pulling people together. 
So there's a lot of other skills. And even when I was deployed, I was, I remember being deployed, I was over the lab department, you know, the lab. So th you can do more than one thing. You get put into different, different roles and the pharmacists are, are really good. They're invaluable because they can cross over and do so many different roles. Isn't that great? That is great. Mm -hmm. That's a testament to the type of thinkers we are because mm -hmm. we're very good at organizing information, I think. We're good at data and statistics, but we're also people people. We enjoy helping and serving other people. So when I say we're people people, <laughs> we're people persons, I guess you could say. Yeah. We enjoy helping people no matter whether it's with medicine or whether they're sick or healthy or whether they're a peer or a patient or somebody higher up. Yeah, we're. I think we're team players for sure. That's one of the things that attracted me to the pharmacy profession in the first place. Right, and we don't have to get, you know, we've always been in this supportive role. We're, um, Rear Admiral Guyberson says this, and I actually agree. We sort of have trained. We don't need to be the one in charge. We can support the person in charge very easily. We're, we've been trained that way. So if we're on a team, we, we're not the one in charge, but we're supporting the medical team. So we get that training already. And uh, anyway, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's really great. So we get a lot of pharmacists, and we work really well with everybody. So that's the main thing, working with and being able to adapt and adapt. You're, there's a lot of adap adaption. So I, it's been really interesting going and getting caught up with all the officers and watching and hearing some of their stories and hearing about some of their deployments. It's very impressive. I'm just overwhelmedly impressed with them every day. Yes. I, every time I talk to a Public Health Service Commissioned Corps officer, I am impressed as well. Going back to visibility, though, you just gave a, a lot of different statements about how there's not a lot of self-promotion about the public health service. And that is one of the themes in the film, the PBS documentary, Invisible Corps. They talk about how the public health service does their job so well, no one knows they exist. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. So there's a film, fe we've been going to the film festivals and I'll tell you when you see the response after you see him watch it, especially for people that had no clue about us at all. So at these film festivals, we're getting a brand new audience. And there's a, a set of videos that were shared with us. Somebody recorded their people's impression afterwards. And I'm, gonna, I'm talking about this because I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. You li listen to them and you hear it. And it's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea they existed. I had no idea. We're getting so many people brand new that had never even heard because it is invisible and you take advantage that there's clean water out there and but then you need to understand why is there clean water and what's causing that clean water we take it we take all these things for granted and what what was brought out in the film is people don't notice because we're because we're doing this they don't you don't notice it until we would be gone so until we're gone so it also talked a little bit about some of the challenges. We're federal, and so we just have where we're interspersed throughout. People don't realize, and even I'll be honest with you, until the filming was started and I started digging in and doing some more digging too, I didn't even realize CDC had people all around in our communities. So, you know, of course I found some of them because they're not that visible either. You know, we have a CDC person in my town where I, not in the town, but in our county where we live. So they have them set aside there because they're invisible, but they're providing direction. So it's just, I think it makes, it'll make the people that have never known about this feel comfortable to know that there is somebody that's out there doing this and they need to be listening more because what happens is the funding for the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps is part of that discretionary funding. So when you're starting to hear about the budget cuts, there, you know, there's only a certain amount of the pie and and it's got to be divided between all these different departments. And, you know, we're part, we're in there mixed in with the emergency response and public health. And so when you hear those things, it, it goes, ah, you go, ah, you know, because you know that our, somewhere along the line, our department's going to probably be cut. So we're used to kind of like waxing and waning over the years, you know, where there's funding and then not funding, funding, not funding, kind of going back and forth. So it can be challenging, but people don't also realize we have officers, and I think you said you had your first introduction to public health service with the FDA. You know, all the drug shortage issues, the, you know, the, just 
the the challenges if you remember when they they had um like when you when you have to get drugs moving drugs around just all that drug shortage challenges we have officers that are on that they're really good about responding especially when there's hurricanes you know how do we get products somewhere and helping to coordinate that and they can actually adjust or extend expiration dates you know there's things that they're doing over there at that end to help make sure that you don't miss a beat so that's why people just take it for granted because those things are all fixed proactively and then you just oh we have everything we don't think about what caused all of that to happen so the film does talk about that uh, one of the really good stories that was told there was about um if people remember anthrax with the envelopes in the mail and I remember, you know, that one quietly went away. That was us pretty much handling that whole thing, that whole process and being able to fix that. And that just, it's there one day and then it's not the next day because the infrastructure was put in place then to protect, protect people. So that's why I'm saying people just don't realize it's there, but it's a lot of really good, talented experts that come together, that know how to work together as a team, that know policy, that know logistics that know all these have all these different skill sets that can do this. Yes, the skill sets are important, the outcomes are important. I mm -hmm. think I see a parallel between the public health service and pharmacists in general not being self-promotional. We're too busy doing what is needed to stop and show the outcomes to people. I think that's what, one of the reasons why any medical person has a difficult time expressing a value statement, you know, I cure, for example, tuberculosis so that it no longer exists in the United States to, mm -hmm. you know, a certain extent. Or I cure Ebola so it doesn't get on this continent. Or I, you know, oh, we got to talk about what the Surgeon General has done for lung cancer and decreasing the number of smokers in the United States. I mean, if somebody from the public health service were saying what their value statement is, you know, I... I decrease the number of smokers in the United States so people live longer, healthier lives. They could say something like that, but they just don't necessarily come out and do it. But like you were saying earlier, people kind of take it for granted that these outcomes are happening, whether somebody's being self-promotional about it or not. Would you like to talk about any of those topics, smoking in America, no smallpox, no Ebola, you know, even the decrease of sexually transmitted diseases in the early days, you know, World War One era? Go ahead. As you were talking, it made me think, I just got back from Alaska where we showed the film there in Anchorage. And I will tell you, it warmed my heart. I was so happy to hear this. So they had, we showed the film and then following, there were some panelists. The officers there were talking about, you know, their jobs and what they did. And the area director for the Indian Health Service there up in the Alaska area also spoke and talked about just how important those officers there were there up there in Alaska and the value that they had serving the Alaska natives, you know, in that state. And one of the things that I think is really, really helpful, and this is why you see so many pharmacy officers in the Indian Health Service. And when I say that, I'm also including tribal, they work at tribal facilities or Indian Health Service. I kind of encompass both of them and urban areas. One of their value is the way our, the type of person that goes in is always striving. It's a, it's a core value, striving for excellence. They, and, and, and the promotions are kind of lined, aligned with this. They want to always continuously be improving, continuously learning, learning. They want to get involved with impactful projects. That's what gets someone promoted. So they're always looking for those. So if I'm an employer and I want to hire someone and I need to implement a new project, I'm going to put an officer on that because they're already self-motivated. It's in them already to want to try to pull together and do this and make this successful. So the value is, too, is the type of person that goes into it and that they're they are they get excited about working on a project and most people go oh no it's more work it's the opposite they're like oh this is i get to be part of this program implementing a new you know whatever clinical program or implementing this new idea they want to be part of all of that so um now i just wanted to say that now kind of going back to what you were saying about some of the other 
when I, my first duty station, I was there, we were working on TB, tuberculosis, and I was, we were working with epidemiologists. I didn't really realize the breadth of what I was part of when I first came in. It wasn't until later on that the light bulb went on, but I, you know, you take it for granted working on hepatitis A and, you know, working on diabetes. And, you know, I was, I was a, a cog in the wheel, so I didn't see the big picture, I'll be honest with you, when I was a junior officer. And I think the film helps even us as officers seeing that this bigger picture, because I know a lot of people didn't know how the breadth of what we did. So for instance, what was brand new for me was the National Park Service. I remember, <laughs> I remember going there a few years ago. In fact, we, I knew we had to have the National Park Service in there. So I told when I talked to Chris, we got to have the National Park Service in there. I went to visit and I had a colleague that was in the National Park Service doing public health. Well, I wasn't sure what they did exactly. So she says, oh, you know, when I went to the Grand Canyon, go visit, go visit my, my, I used to, he was my old boss, go visit with him. His name was Lewis Rowe. He was the deputy superintendent or something. That was his role. And I visited with him and I said, oh yeah, um, Captain Newman told me to visit with you and you would, t uh, about the relationship between the park service and the public health. So he went on and we have a relationship for like a hundred years. And he told me all the public health initiatives that were done at the national parks. And I go, that was us. Wow. I mean, so this is, that's what I'm talking about is the breadth. So the film when we were talking about, remember that six month brainstorming, we knew that not even the officers know what the other officers are doing because we're so, there's, we're, we're so scattered throughout. People don't realize we have officers in other countries too. So anyway, it was good for all of us to do the film. I think we've all learned from it, even those that thought we knew everything. And um, it's good for the public to see it's all in one, crammed in one hour and then what we put together are certain topics that would be of interest that you can have a conversation about. So they're like two, three minutes. There's about 25 of them on, on a variety of different topics. It talks about the categories, talks about some of the challenges too, you know, public health challenges uh, that we've had over the years too. So they're dual topics, but they're meant to be as conversation starters too. It's almost like there could be a study guide with this, you know, like on the topic of blah, blah, blah. Do you remember when you were a kid, what did they tell you about smoking cessation? And then today, do you know what has happened? And, you know, that would be really cool to have a study guide where people yes. can reflect on what yes. used to be and your own personal experience and then what you're experiencing now. Because, for example, yeah. this, the Surgeon General's impact on smoking cessation has been enormous. I think, if I remember right, there was something like half the country was smoking. Half of the country over the age of 18 was smoking back in 1960, I think. And nowadays, it's in the teens. Right. And if you think about look at all the movies that were made in the 50s and 60s, everybody's smoking. <laughs> I know we noticed that a lot. We noticed that a lot. So yeah, there is impact. I think one of the challenges, and this this comes up now, and that's one of the reasons why the timing of the film is good. It's because with COVID, you know, there is some. I'm going to say people when it, like public health seems to be a bad word a little bit. Um, I'll just well, it is where I live. It is in parts of the country. Some places in parts of the country, it seems to be you know, a little bit challenging. So part of it is too, is to, to have them understand the bigger picture and to trust and where we get information and to be able to talk about some of these topics and how they came to be. And with social media and everything like that, it's just, it's changed a little bit. So what, what happens now is we're trying to re help rebuild some of the trust too. So when you meet these officers, that's why we need to be more visible. When you meet them and you see when you see their work that they're doing and you go, okay, yeah, these are really, these people really care for our country and it's not political. We're not political. We're apolitical. Thank you for sharing about the documentary. I, I want to say just a couple more things about the documentary that I noticed. I already mentioned that one of the themes was that the Public Health Service Commission Corps does their job so well that nobody even knows about them. There's that. But then this it also provides the history of the public health service, which I found very interesting. I didn't realize that the public health service has been around for more than 
a hundred years. I, I didn't count. I didn't do the math, but I think it's almost 150 years. Is that right? Well, it's actually, that's the Commission Corps. We've been around since the back in 18, uh, 1789. We've been back. We were actually there because we were, we were, uh, we took care of, public health took care of the Marine. We, what we actually do, we were taking care of the um, disabled seamen that were fighting part of the Revolutionary War. Then later on, later on, we actually got more organized under our first Surgeon General, John Woodworth. And uh, that's when they made it into the Corps, and that was 1889. So that's when it actually got more like a commission corps, but we were still considered public health. The Marine hot, we were Marine hospital service earlier. So yeah, the history was very interesting. And how it's evolved and it's evolved over time. Yeah. And everybody has heard of C. Everett Coop. Yes. And so you, and the film talks about him a little bit there. I had a chance to meet him when I first came in, he was a surgeon general. So I was a very young officer at the time and I was so junior that I had to be, I was way in the back of the room, but I saw him and I was too scared to go up and talk to him. I was very, very shy back then, but um, I saw him. I was there in the room when he spoke. So that was pretty exciting. Later on, of course, since then, I've known all the others, all the, most of the Surgeon Generals. That's very cool. I, there were a number of former Surgeon Generals featured in this documentary. My listeners, you have to check out this documentary the Invisible Corps, and it's on pbs.org. It aired in May of 2023. If you have not watched it, I will put a link to it in the show notes. You have got to check it out. Pam, is there anything else you'd like to talk about with the documentary before we start wrapping this up? No, I'm just very thankful. This was um, this whole thing, what motivated all of us to help with this project is because we wanted the officers to know and we want um, even the veterans to know that you know what, we see you and we see the work that you've done and it's really a way to honor, honor all of them. So the film is to honor all my, all my um, colleagues, my U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps colleagues. So thank you for letting us have this time to talk about this. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was a great documentary. Thank you for being part of the push to get it out there and getting all of your, for lack of a better term, your homies together to make this film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's cool when you can, you have a reason to go to somebody mm -hmm. and ask for help. I think like you were saying, a lot of people just like to help. They like to serve. Veterans like to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's ingrained into all of us. You can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> help me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're very active in retirement. Would you like to talk about what, what else you're working on? You know, now that the documentary is out, what's next for you? Well, we're using, we're actually using the documentaries to launch off. Like, I'm really excited about, I'm really excited. So in a couple weeks, we're going to be in D.C. and working with the National Park Service Department of Interior. It follows in there. They're launching this big initiative on climate change, you know, and uh, so they've got together all the different HHS, Department of Health and Human Services agencies, and we're going to be launching it. In fact, I will, I'll just send you. I'll send you some information on this and it's going to be really great for the public to start seeing. So we're trying to be visible with this. We're, we're launching this big push for this. So it'll be there at the Department of Interior. The, at the same time, it's, this is National Pharmacy Month. American Pharmacist Month. Mar yep. Yeah. Yeah. American Pharmacist Month and um, American Pharmacist Association, APHA is going to be recognizing federal pharmacy for that. So we'll be having an event there. So we have an event all around the school. And I think that's probably the thing that I, for any listeners that are listening, if you are interested in showing the film and you would need help to connect with officers that are in your community, I can help with that. So I'm actually putting this out. That's what we're trying to do is let them know that they're in your community. We don't have to fly them in. We'll find the ones that are in your community and they'll come share what they do. And you can hear what's going on in your own community because they're all around. Isn't that great? Yes, I was just going to say that's such a great opportunity because mm -hmm. like we were talking about this whole entire episode, there's a visibility issue. There are people in your community already who are in public health, maybe even the public health service, who can help you set up mm -hmm. a screening and talk about what they personally do in your mm -hmm. own community. 
That's a great educational opportunity. And then they can hear yes. what you're working on and what the issues are. That's actually what we're doing is we're telling them what topics are you working on in this community? So it, people are, it's fascinating to hear. And then you realize, oh, there's somebody working on this. <laughs> this was a hero film. Thank you for saying that. Yes, absolutely. You guys are public health heroes for sure. Mm. But also there was a lot of what's in it for the community too. Mm -hmm. We're getting you safe water, not just what pharmacists do, okay? But mm -hmm. we're making sure you have safe water, safe air, safe cities, hopefully, and all the other things too. We're making sure that the COVID-19 pandemic is winding down because of the vaccinations. We're making sure that tuberculosis is not widespread. We're doing sex ed, all the things. Some of the topics are a little bit more timely than others, but for anyone who wants to live a healthy life, the public health service is your public health hero. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Thank you. You said it so well. Perfect. My pleasure. Well, as we start to wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Anything you're working on that you'd like to promote or a book you might be writing with your daughter? Anything? The floor is yours, ma'am. Okay, well, this is just sort of side things, not related to what we've been talking about. So now we're working on a book about baseball. We love baseball. So my son-in-law are doing that book. And um, I, we, the Diamondbacks are in the playoffs, so that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> And, uh, you know, seeing with the grandkids, oh, the book is the book that you helped, you helped us talk, you talked about it. It's there being sold at the Grand Canyon now. So we're very excited about that. Nice. And we have, we have lots of trips lined up, more travel trips, going places, doing things. So that's all good. Anyway, some of the other projects that I'm working on right now are really pharmacy related, a little bit pharmacy, doing some writing and, uh, doing things on uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, doing some efforts on that, and still helping rural communities get their voice heard, Medicare Part D. So it's just a variety of different topics. Interoperability, it's always that. And um, probably the biggest project that I'm right now working on is changing the, or, or helping to plant seeds for payment reform, for uh, more team-based care. So some of the there's some primary care models that are kind of adapting. So it's it's more on the policy side. That's the area that I'm interested in. And it's really fun getting data and information together and re lit doing all the research, collecting all the papers that are out there, and then ch just trying to plant seeds. And is really what it is. I'm a seed planter. Have we thought about doing this way? Is this something we can do? And trying to pull it together so we can start moving the needle forward. Pharmacists are making a difference. I do have one quick story I just want to tell you that I think is really neat is that uh, some of the for some of the teams that are first time, this is medical teams that are, you know, they first time that they've added a pharmacist, that one of the quotes that I heard that just is really warm, it's really hard to measure what is the pharmacist doing on a team? It's really hard to measure that exactly because they're doing so many things. As you we just talked about, they can do so many things. So what ended up happening is when you give the far, give a team a pharmacist that's never had one, then they kind of work in and get kind of get the lay of the land and they start to integrate in where they do. You can't take that pharmacist away once the team has had it. So they'll say the, the quote was the prescribers were saying, I've never felt more confident in my prescribing in my entire career than when I've had a pharmacist here on my team. So I don't we never we can't get rid of them. So isn't that kind of cool? I like hearing that. That's an indispensable situation. Yes. You yes. have talked about how the pharmacist can make yes. himself or herself indispensable. Yes. Yeah, I know. So it's great. That's an encouraging so story. Right. So that those are the things. That's what keeps me going to, I'll be honest with you, because we got to do more of that. We got to do more of that. Get these out there. We're invisible. You know, this is why we're invisible too. <laughs> Pharmacists kind of are. You know what I mean? They're doing these things that people don't realize they're doing. Yep. And we're not very self-promotional, but uh -uh. podcast episodes like this help with visibility, uh -huh. even though this is a, a listener only type activity, right. but still this helps yeah. get visibility for pharmacists and veterans and the public health service. So it's all good. Yeah. And I, and thanks. So thanks for the time to do this. And what I'll do is I can provide you with 
some of the links to the shorter versions, shorter little specific topics that people might be interested in. What I have found, and I thank you so much for watching the whole film. I think that's great. Um, people don't have time to watch a whole film. In fact, I know many of our officers, they're so busy because they work early in the morning to late at night. They haven't even seen it. So this has been really fun getting around and having them see the whole film and see people's reaction to it. It's very rewarding seeing that and being able to thank them to the public in their communities to be able to thank them for their service. So I've enjoyed that too. We've enjoyed that too. Yeah, you're doing great work. I appreciate you coming back to the mm -hmm. Pharmacist Voice podcast to talk about how you continue to use your voice as a pharmacist, even in retirement. Thank you for your service. And thanks again for being here on the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Take care, Pam. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye, Kim. Thanks again to Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD, for being my guest today. This was my Veterans Day 2023 episode. I hope you, my audience, will take some time this weekend to watch the PBS documentary Invisible Corps and reflect on the many contributions the United States Public Health Service has made to the health of our nation. They have made a significant contribution to the health of the United States. If you're a pharmacist or a student who's interested in joining the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps, please visit usphs.gov for more information and also check out my other interviews with United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps officers. I have at least five now. Links to all five of those are in the show notes on thepharmacistvoice.com. Click on the podcast tab and find episode 251. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you for joining me for episode 251 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. If you're in the United States, thank a veteran for their service this weekend and check out the show notes on thepharmacistvoice.com. In the show notes, you'll find a link to Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer, PharmD, on LinkedIn, the link to the PBS documentary Invisible Corps, several Public Health Service Commissioned Corps officer interviews, my social media links, and more. If you know someone who's considering a career in public health, even if they're not going into the Commissioned Corps, Please share this episode with them. They may become inspired by hearing about other people who are in the public health space. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe to or follow the Pharmacist Voice podcast on your favorite podcast player and YouTube to get each new episode right when it comes out. I'll be back next Friday, November 17th with my fall 2023 update. My seasonal updates, like this one coming up, give you an opportunity to get to know me better as a person. This is where I update you on my personal life, my podcast, my business, and what I've been listening to, reading, watching, and playing. Thanks again for listening today. I'll talk to you next Friday.